Exciting news, ladies. You are officially invited. Yes, you. You're invited to join us in Fertility Awareness Mastery Live. This is my 10-week group coaching program designed to help you gain confidence using fertility awareness. Whether you're actively avoiding pregnancy or looking to optimize your cycles for conception, we have a spot for you. We start the third week of September. Are you ready to jump in? Head over to fertilityfriday.com slash fam, F-A-M, to register today. That's fertilityfriday.com slash fam. This is the Fertility Friday podcast, episode number 376. Welcome to the Fertility Friday podcast, your source for information about the fertility awareness method and all things fertility. I'm your host, Lisa Hendrickson-Jack. I'm the author of The Fifth Vital Sign and the Fertility Awareness Mastery Charting Journal. I'm a certified fertility awareness educator and holistic reproductive health practitioner with nearly 20 years of experience teaching women to connect to their fifth vital sign through menstrual cycle charting, balancing hormonal health, and optimizing the menstrual cycle without hormones. I'm outspoken about hormonal birth control and its impact on fertility and overall health because you have the right to know how your body works and how artificial hormones disrupt that natural process. I host live coaching programs to help you achieve optimal fertility and health because it's important to have healthy menstrual cycles regardless of whether or not you want to have babies. I'm also a wife and mother of two beautiful boys. I know, I know, I'm a busy girl, but I managed to fit it all in. This podcast is designed to empower you to take full control of your cycles, your fertility, and your overall health. And I'm so excited that you're here with us today. Today, I'm sharing another episode in my summer series where we're diving back into the archives and where I'm sharing some of the most relevant episodes, still episodes that I share all the time that I talk about all the time. And I'm not sure if there's an episode that I talk about as much as today's episode that I'm sharing with you. Today, I'm sharing my podcast interview with Dr. Miranda Naylor. And so this episode really opened my eyes. And I think that this may have been one of the first times that I interviewed a medical doctor and like just dove in with all the questions about med school and how does this work and what did you learn and why is it the doctors are always prescribing the pill for everything and all of that. And so certainly this is one of the episodes that I probably refer to (laughs) the most. I know that there's a handful that I refer to all the time, but this is certainly one. And I quoted from this episode in The Fifth Vital Sign to really share and make that point of we we really need to educate ourselves on how doctors are trained and understand the modality that they're working from so that we can be better prepared for our appointments, so that we can have more realistic expectations of what kind of care and support we can receive from doctors. And those silly analogies like, well, I wouldn't go to McDonald's and expect them to wash my car. It kind of applies. If you don't know what your doctor, what services your doctor is providing, and you're expecting them to provide something that is not within their specialization, then you're not really going to be happy with those interactions. So with that said, let's go ahead and jump into my interview with Dr. Miranda Naylor. So without further ado, welcome to the show, Dr. Naylor. Hi, thanks for having me. Well, thanks so much for coming on the show. It was pretty random. Um, You had reached out to me just to thank me for the podcast. And I was like, hey, you want to be on the show? Right. (laughs) Um, But I would just love for you to take a few minutes to introduce yourself and just talk about what inspired you to become a doctor in the first place. Yeah. um, So yeah, so I I just recently finished residency training in family medicine. Um, Like you said, I'm an osteopathic doctor, uh, which here in the U.S. is the same as, you know, medical doctor. We just get a little extra training in like musculoskeletal medicine. um, And we have a philosophy of kind of treating the whole patient. um, So it's a little bit more holistic. And yeah, I, I was kind of inspired to go into medicine because of that philosophy there's also a philosophy of that the body's kind of self-healing. Um, and so I really liked that. So that's kind of what's inspired me in the first place. Okay. And then maybe you could talk a little bit about your experience then, I guess, what brought you to the show essentially, which was that as a doctor, when you're treating female patients, part of how it goes is that, you know, women come in with certain issues and concerns and then are often um, prescribed the birth control pill. And so maybe you talk a little bit about your experience from the medical perspective and how your own personal experience has now 
put some of those things into question? So, well, for my own personal story, so I was basically on hormonal contraception of one sort or another from like age 17 and going through pre-medical school, medical school, um, and being very focused on that, of course I didn't want to get pregnant. And so I did what most, I would say women do is, you know, they're on the pill, don't worry about it. And so even as a doctor, I never thought anything of it and never even thought to consider, you know, going off of it at one point or anything until I finally was getting towards the end of my residency and thought, Hey, this is a great time to start a family finally and stop the birth control pill. Actually, I was on a uh, uh, new ring at the time and stopped it. And, you know, months and months later, still never got a period. I had normal periods on the pill, um, or on contraception, but wasn't getting a period and kind of find, found myself in this whole new territory that I wasn't prepared for, um, even as a doctor and all my training of what to do to kind of get my period back. So I went through the normal medical route. Um, I started going to an OB. She had tried me on some things, got referred to an endocrinologist when those things didn't work. Those things didn't work. Tests were all normal. And then finally, you know, was referred to a reproductive endocrinologist who is like a quote unquote fertility specialist and got to that point of, again, recommendations of medications and, you know, kind of the end point that you hear about is like IVF, uh, IUI and things like that. So kind of went through the whole uh, Western medicine path um, when you are having issues with fertility and found myself being very unsatisfied with that. And so that's what kind of got me interested. And I actually just happened to stumble upon your podcast, but looking into all these natural fertility things that you can do way beyond the normal medical stuff that I had no idea about. So it's been a whole new learning experience for me. Well, and in the, in the intro that I shared with the audience, when I introduced you, it mentioned kind of two years. So is the current status, you know, have you had a period to date or is this something that you're still working on? So it's something I'm still working on. Yeah. Um, it's been, I, I think it's been about a year and a half or a year and like eight months, um, at this point. But yeah, I was tried on progesterone and um, that didn't do anything. I, I did Clomid um, for a few uh, rounds and that kind of worked maybe once. Um, I got like a little mini period, um, but then still nothing after that. And that's another reason why I was kind of discouraged by all these medications, kind of stopping to think how many side effects these things have and it's just not working still. And wanting to find out what the underlying cause is. And that's kind of one of the big issues I think with the Western medicine standpoint on this is that there really isn't any concern, unfortunately, with what the underlying issue is like dysregulation of hormones there can be, or, um, imbalance. It's really just, okay, let's force your body to do what we know we can get it to do, um, through these medications. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Well, and a little bit of background information. So, I mean, a lot Mm -hmm. of the listeners have had maybe not the exact same experience, but similar experiences. So Mm -hmm. could you maybe share with us how long kind of in total you were taking hormonal contraceptives and perhaps uh, if you had switched brands? I know a lot of women perhaps have some, they don't really like the one. And so they end up switching to another in their kind of period of, of time there. Right. So, yeah, so I was on it for about 13 years. Um, mostly on, um, a pill form, um, like the tricycle kind of pill that, um, I can explain further. So basically like the birth control pill, um, has estrogen and progesterone. It's a combined, um, oral contraceptive and those hormones kind of act as a negative feedback to your body to keep you from ovulating. And then there are different kinds that, you know, there's a kind that has three different levels of hormones basically throughout the month that are supposedly supposed to mimic mimic a little bit more of a normal cycle, but still keep you from ovulating. So I was on those mostly. And then probably just a few years before stopping um, birth control, I'd gone on to NuvaRing just to kind of try something new. And that's a vaginal ring that also has estrogen and progesterone. It kind of works the same way in your body, but it's just absorbed 
um, instead of being in your gut and um, in your vaginal cavity. <laughs> well, and can I ask so, another question mm-hmm. then? So from what you remember, you mentioned that you went on the pill around age 17. From what you mm-hmm. remember about your cycles before, so before pill, BP, <laughs> we'll just make mm-hmm. up acronym, <laughs> acronyms today. But um, what do you remember about your cycles back then? Honestly, it's kind of sad that I don't remember much. I even asked my mom, I was like, do you remember them ever being abnormal or anything? I think they're pretty normal, but I do remember going on the pill partly to know when that was coming. So that makes me a little bit suspicious that maybe they weren't so regular. And of course I had some period pain, but nothing out of control. I remember going on the pill and partly it was because I was going to be sexually active, but also that I just kind of, it was like a control thing almost that I was like, Oh, I'll know exactly when I have my period, you know, like having it perfectly packaged, (laughs) Mm -hmm. um, instead of just letting it be how it was and figuring out why that wasn't something that I even would think about that wasn't taught definitely at that point. And I found even, you know, through medical school, that idea wasn't taught. Well, and it's so concerning the way that to me, of course, from my perspective as a fertility awareness Mm -hmm. educator, from listening to the podcast, I'm sure you're kind of been exposed to my perspective, which is it's really concerning to me when the pill is casually talked about as regulating the menstrual cycle and even the way that the hormones are talked about in terms of being estrogen and progesterone, for example, because mm-hmm. that's actually not what it is. Right. <laughs> in yeah. your body, yeah. you produce, fake, you know, estrogen, estradiol, yeah. you know, estrin, mm-hmm. um, that there's different estrogens that you produce naturally and then, um, progesterone and progestin and estrins and all those different types of combinations right. of hormones are completely different, but, um, it, right. it's comforting as women to hear, oh, well, it's estrogen and progesterone. It mimics my body's cycle. It regulates my period. And, oh, I was having regular periods when I was on the pill and because because women are not, because we're not being educated about it, it's exactly, exactly what you said. Like, why would you think anything of it? This is just, right. you know, exactly. Um, yeah. so then maybe you could talk. I, I'm really, really curious to know what your training was like then in your residency throughout your program, obviously becoming a doctor. Maybe you could share with us how you were trained around birth control in terms of what it does and also what it's for and when to prescribe it. Yeah. So in training, you know, like a typical um, family medicine training in the U S we basically, I mean, we learn of course in medical school about the normal menstrual cycle and when it goes wrong. And of course the normal menstrual cycle is the 28 day normal cycle ovulating on day 14, you know, which we know isn't completely true. And then you learn about birth controls, which are basically categorized by how effective they are. And of course, from the doctor's perspective, what's the most effective is what's going to be like the least amount of risk of pregnancy, basically, is how they're categorized. And so, so we're trained, of course, to, you know, counsel women about all the different types. And the way of counseling it is, of course, recommending the most effective types over the ones that aren't seen as, as effective. So of course the most effective would be things like sterilization or things like the IUD um, or implants because there's no room for error. It's there, you know, it's, it's, it may or may not be, you know, putting off these hormones, but basically there's, there's no way for a person to forget it or, you know, you know, not be taking it, not be using it correctly. And so of course, from a doctor's perspective, that's the most effective. Then, you know, after that would be like the pill, condoms, barrier methods, and then kind of, as I know you've talked about many times is, would be, you know, the rhythm method or fertility awareness method. And unfortunately those two are grouped together in our education. And so of course, because there is so much room for error, because it is completely user dependent, it has a lower efficacy from that standpoint. So we normally would counsel on all of those different types and kind of leave it up to the woman's opinion or, you know, their decision of what they make, which is how it should be. You know, it should ultimately be up to them, but that is the information that they're getting from their doctors. And as, you know, as everyone knows, the doctor's visit can be pretty short because of all the constraints of HMOs and whatnot. So it's a quick intro of all these different methods. What do you want? And, you know, that's what you'll get kind of thing. 
And there actually are. So the CDC guidelines, they're based basically on the World Health Organization research that was actually done in 2011. That's still the current recommendations. And then in 2015, the CDC released like kind of new recommendations still based on that research, but a new um, recommendation list that um, was to promote the contraception uh, or that contraception is readily available to all women. So it's really promoting those same methods that I discussed, the ones that were seen as most effective and also recommends, which I thought would be interesting to kind of add is that it recommends using them until age 50 or 55 because in quotes, there's no test uh, reliability that verifies the cessation of fertility. So it's kind of recommending all women be on some sort of birth control up until like age 50 or 55. So it's very, you know, pro birth control from that perspective. Wow. So yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I feel like I need like a second to digest that. (laughs) It's not entirely surprising, but to hear that out loud, that the official recommendation then is essentially, right, as soon as you're of age that you could potentially be sexually active. So, I mean, women are being put, young women are being put on these hormonal contraceptives at younger and younger age, at ages. So essentially the logic is that you use them the entire, your entire adult life, basically mm-hmm. up until age 50. And then when you want to have kids, you just go off of it for those few years and then you go right, right back on. Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I have to say, I mean, of course, this is from a standpoint of trying to, to be helpful and, you know, it's always like, do no harm. That's number one for doctors. It's, trying to make it accessible for women so that they have what they need. Um, You know, of course, like the uh, plan B pills now over the counter that women can get for emergency contraceptive. It's supposed to be that all women have access for what they want. But what it comes down to is that, yeah, it's very pro hormonal contraceptive or, you know, of course there are other methods, but that's kind of number one, the most prescribed And yeah, well, I'm glad that you said that because I mean, that's part of the reason that I wanted to have you on the show as well, because what I, especially being part of this fertility awareness world and everything, especially when you first discover it, then you can really get into this natural fertility awareness, good medicine, evil perspective, Mm -hmm. (laughs) right? Um, (laughs) Fertility awareness, trying to try to conceive good IVF evil. And so you can Mm -hmm. create this dichotomy when even as a seasoned fertility awareness educator who works with clients and to try to help women learn what's happening with their cycles and identify any potential cycle irregularity. So I'm definitely coming from a natural perspective. Mm -hmm. I think that it's important to also acknowledge kind of the reality of the situation. When you're going to your physician, they're not trying to destroy your body. (laughs) Mm -hmm. That might happen in some cases if a woman's particularly sensitive to these medications. But I think it's important to understand their perspective. Uh, You know, I don't think these doctors are intentionally harming women's body. I don't know if that makes it better or worse, right? That's not their intention, but it may still happen. But maybe you could share just to touch a little bit more on what you said, which is that they're trying to be helpful and they're trying to provide women with choices. So maybe you could share from a doctor's perspective why hormonal contraceptives are considered to be, quote unquote, good. You know, definitely from I can speak from my perspective before going through all this and learning so much more was that. You know, the birth control pill, I'll use that as kind of the main example since that's the most prescribed, you know, that it's a pretty benign thing that pretty much everyone's on it. I remember actually going to my doctor's office throughout my life and they'd say, oh, are you on any medications? And I'd say, no, just the birth control pill. Like even in my own brain, I didn't think of that as a medication, almost like a vitamin (laughs) or a supplement. That's just something that you're on. And I think a lot of doctors have that same perspective. I mean, and that it goes across the board with a lot of different medications that I'm now, you know, learning more about and not agreeing with. So even things as simple as like Pepsid or Zantac for your heartburn, you know, it, these medications have side effects that they're now realizing that, you know, doesn't help you uh, or doesn't let you absorb things as well as you should, things like that. So, so the overall perspective, I think, is that the birth control pill is a very benign thing. Of course, there is a risk of stroke, heart attack, 
which are huge things, but it's mostly, oh, if you smoke, you shouldn't be on this pill because that increases your risk. You know, different types of the birth control pill have a greater risk of things like that, of stroke. But other than that, you know, maybe some nausea. Other than that, there isn't really much counseling on all the side effects. And I think much um, knowledge or attention to the side, the you know, negative side effects that those hormonal contraceptive uh, contraceptive pills can have. Interestingly, um, just last week there was a new um, article that came out from the American Osteopathic Association that was talking about how hormonal contraception can be associated with higher risk of depression. So, which is one of the side effects that you, you'll see listed on, you know, the box of things. But now there are several articles that recently came out and studies that came out. Um, one being the Journal of American Medical Association uh, Psychiatry show that there is a higher risk of depression in women who are on the pill um, and a higher uh, chance of being on antidepressants, which these things are huge. You know, these side effects yeah. are things we're talking about, you know, starting someone on antidepressants a risk of stroke in a young female, not to mention all of the things, you know, dizziness, change in mood. And ultimately, of course, what's probably causing all those things is the complete change in hormones. Because like you said, these aren't natural hormones. They're completely, you know, chemical fake hormones, but that still have this effect on your body to negatively have a negative feedback on your hypothalamus or pituitary which controls you, all of the hormones in your body. So I think we don't even know what extent the negative impact could be of all these things that we're just kind of messing with un, unwilling or, un, you know, without knowing. So, yeah. Well, I wanted to touch on something that you said before I ask you another question. Mm-hmm. I'm so happy that you shared just the the honest reality that when you're on hormonal contraceptives, you really don't think of it as a medication. And I have taken hormonal contraceptives as well. I took them when I was around the same age that you started, around age 16 or, or so. And I probably wouldn't have put those listed them either because I didn't really think of it as a medication. And Mm -hmm. I think that that's highly problematic, especially in light of what we're talking about now, which is the side effects. So just the other day, I was talking to a close girlfriend of mine who found herself in the ER in the middle of the night because she was having panic attacks. And she is Mm -hmm. also in, in the medical profession. She's not a doctor. She's a health professional. And she said that when the doctor asked her if she's on any medication, she said no, because it only occurred to her after So Uh since she's been off of the pill now for maybe three or four years and she hasn't had any episodes like that. And now she's learned so much more about some of the side effects. It didn't even, so she's fully in the ER, right? With a panic attack, anxiety attack Uh that is actually linked to her hormonal contraception. (laughs) And when the doctor said, because the doctor said, did you take anything? Did you take drugs? Because she was hysterical, right? Uh And they were trying to figure out maybe if she had done some recreational drugs. Cause mm-hmm. that's how bad it was. And, but yeah. no, nothing, no. And it's, so I'm really glad you highlighted that. So I, I want to get a better understanding of how doctors then are informed about the side effects. So when I first started doing this podcast, I, I just recently released my anniversary episode, episode 100. I was really excited about it. So this episode that we're recording today will be released about say three or four weeks afterwards. And in that episode, I kind of did a compilation of all, not all, but so many different clips that have come out over the past 100 episodes that stood out for me. And one of the very first episodes that I recorded was an episode that I did with Dr. Laura Bryden. And I Mm -hmm. asked her, you know, what are the most common side effects that you see? She's a naturopathic doctor. What are the most common side effects that you see in your patients when they are on hormonal contraceptives. And like you alluded to, I expected her to say stroke, typical things that we we often hear. And what she said, the first thing was depression and then loss Mm -hmm. of libido. And Mm -hmm. so this journey of mine then to do this podcast, some of the side effects that are really common, it's not even like one-offs, they're so common. So the depression, anxiety, Loss of libido, which can turn out to be permanent to some degree because of the way that the birth control pill impacts a woman's testosterone levels, her free testosterone, Mm -hmm. (laughs) and it can be like permanent to some degree. And in addition to that, I recently did an episode with Dr. Susan Rako, where she talked about her research in the area of the pill and how it's linked 
to cervical dysplasia. Mm -hmm. And then there's also a great deal of research showing that the longer a woman is on the pill, the pill can cause some of her cervical crypts to kind of atrophy so that she ends up having less crypts that produce that peak fertile type quality mucus. So what that means is like, it's like all of these things. So for a woman who's been on the pill for a really long time, it's possible that it could take her body some time to heal, especially to be able to produce that cervical mucus that she needs in order to conceive Uh a baby. So where, from your experience then, from your training, what side effects are highlighted and how are they discussed? So like I said, it was, it's pretty much a focus on like stroke blood clots that will counsel women on, um, mostly, you know, after a certain age and if they're a smoker and for certain birth control pills that have a higher risk of that, honestly, I think those are pretty much it that most people talk about. Of course, all the side effects you mentioned also, I think for certain doctors, they may know for certain, they may not know, honestly, or, you know, be aware of. So mostly, mostly it really is just stroke blood clots that are the side effects that are discussed, I think. And then of course, the things that would make someone not want to take it because it's very obvious, like upset stomach, maybe some dizziness, nausea. I think those are really the most, you know, the side effects that are mostly talked about. And as you touched on too, of how long it takes afterwards. It usually is counseled that it could take a little while, but it's mostly that vague. It could take, you know, it could be immediate or it could be, you know, up to a few months or a year, but it's very vague and not really talked about, you know, like you said, the long-term effects of it, which I think should really be out there that, that not only should women know, but their doctors should know. Um, and be able to counsel them appropriately with all of this list of side effects before starting on something. And again, that goes for all medications that, you know, we don't even know all the side effects of all medications, but, but it should be talked about more, I think, than being so quick to, to prescribe things. Well, and I think that the pill inherently is problematic in Mm -hmm. just in terms of the duration of time that women are typically taking it. Right. So it's hard to say if if a woman was taking the pill, say for six months or a year max, you know, her body, like her body would be able to recover and whatever processes are happening while she's on it. I think that are, they're magnified significantly than just given the the length of time that, that women are typically on it. So this brings me to one of the questions that I wanted to ask you as well. So in terms of, you know, the the education that I've received just by becoming a fertility awareness educator, learning about the reproductive system, learning about the interplay of hormones, the complexity of the menstrual cycle, all the things that are happening throughout the month, and the fact that it's not 28 days ovulation on day 14 for pretty much all like there's very very few (laughs) women that have a cycle every single month that's 28 days and ovulate on day 14 consistently like that's there's one of she's out there her name (laughs) is let's say susan and like it's like hi susan nice to meet you but the rest of us (laughs) don't have that experience so i'm so curious to know how much time is spent on the reproductive system and given kind of your now the contrast in your knowledge from before and after how much education are doctors given about the complexities of the menstrual cycle so in medical school we get actually you know a pretty good course on not only you know it'll be like the anatomy of the whole body including um the reproductive organs we get a lot of education about the different hormones how they work and then of course how that plays into the menstrual cycle for the menstrual cycle itself, though, for education, I think, at least from my what I remember, <laughs> is really more focused on when it goes wrong. So it's like it sets up the normal as that 28-day cycle with ovulation about day 14. And then the pathologies. I think a lot of Western medicine is more focused on pathology when things go wrong. So it's more of an ovulation, primary versus secondary, and amenorrhea, dysmenorrhea, so pain with periods, 
what's called abnormal uterine bleeding now, which used to have some different terms like metomenorrhagia and things like that, that are basically just irregularities in the menstrual cycle. So having really long periods or having a regular timing of periods or having very heavy periods that are now kind of grouped into abnormal uterine bleeding. So the focus, you know, after learning the kind of the basics of the hormone system, the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis, which controls your hormones from the brain to your ovaries and uterus. Beyond that, with the menstrual cycle, it really isn't as much focus on what's normal as much as what what's going on when things are abnormal. And along those same lines, you know, as you go farther down the road for treatment, you know, actually in practice, unfortunately, it loops us back to our initial conversation of the birth control pill, where even though, you know, they are focused more on on those things and what's happening when things go wrong, aside from, of course, being concerned about things like cancer, uterine cancer or something like that, other than that, as I know you're aware, is mostly the solution for all of that is the birth control pill. So it really isn't focused on what's normal, the differences of different women. It's really looking at the normal being the average of women, which turns out to be that 28 day cycle, which is, you know, an average between who knows how many women, you know, that could range from a wide array of differences, but it's kind of just grouped into that one magic number, which a lot of medicine does, you know, even with blood tests and things like that, the normal range is really just an average of multiple people of what their suspected normal is, which can end up being a problem. Yeah. Even with things like um, thyroid function, that's one of my kind of pet peeves is that, you know, the normal range was, you know, taken from a variety of people that were thought to be normal, but may have had some, you know, pathology like subacute hypothyroidism or something like that, where, it's this wide range that's thought to be normal, but people can have start to have issues even while being in the normal range. So I think now, luckily, you know, there's a little bit more focus on optimizing um, people's health and wellness and preventative medicine, catching things before they become a problem and, you know, trying to optimize someone's health to be the best that it can be. And so, so luckily that's getting to be a little bit more mainstream and, um, having a little more focus, but, but unfortunately still for the most part, it is having that, you know, quote unquote normal range. And then if something's grossly out of that normal range, then treating that. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and working with clients then, so it's just a really common experience among women. Clients are not listeners, yourself included, where you Mm -hmm. end up with some sort of issue with your menstrual cycle And then you go to a physician and what they offer you in terms of both treatment and explanation are both unsatisfactory to, to you, like to me. So I've Mm -hmm. had that experience as well for diff for a variety of reasons. I used to have extremely painful periods. So I go to my doctor and I want to know why. So I'm that annoying patient that says, (laughs) cause I am right. I'm a bad patient because bad patients don't know what the doctors are told, (laughs) but then it makes it so much more complicated because then you go and you say, well, you know, why is it painful? And the doctor typically doesn't spend a lot of time addressing the why, because that's not part of the training, but they're willing to give you a solution, which doesn't solve the root cause, but gives you kind of that temporary relief or that feeling of, so for example, if you have irregular periods and your doctor puts you on a hormonal contraceptive to force a fake bleed, which is not a period, but Mm -hmm. it's reassuring. It's kind of like a pat on the head, like, oh, don't worry. I can make your body bleed every 28 days feel better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) Um, Mm -hmm. So then I guess the, the question stemming out of that is, you know, now that you have these two differing perspectives, I don't know how, how do you think that, what do you think would have to change in terms of the medical system for doctors to start addressing these issues for women, for women to have more what am I trying to say? How to address <laughs> the, the dissatisfaction, right? Like, yeah. cause it's a general common theme among women mm-hmm. where they just don't really feel satisfied with the services that they're getting from their physicians. And right. so sometimes I would, 
uh, part of part of the reason to do this interview too is to I think it's important to know what like who you're going to if you're going to a doctor it's important to understand the perspective that they're coming from right and so you can't yeah. really expect a certain like you there's certain things you can't really expect from a classically trained physician right so i think one way well so for one thing kind of like how to talk to your doctor and how how to like kind of see things from their perspective is like i said you know there isn't much focus on those things. And there may not be any knowledge of it, of what other options there are. For example, for say, you know, painful periods, you know, you go to your doctor and you're dissatisfied. And from your doctor's perspective, they may be kind of dissatisfied with their own opinion too, in the sense that, you know, they might not know any other options for you. So they give you what they can. You know, with a lot of patients, I give the example of the toolbox where say you go to a surgeon, what's in their toolbox? Well, a scalpel. So they might suggest using it. It's just like if you had only a hammer, you might think that anything needs to be hammered. So, so the doctor is going to do their best with helping you, but they may not have the tools to help you in any natural way. They may not have any explanation of why it's going on. They, their solution for you, um, is probably, you know, NSAIDs like ibuprofen and the birth control pill to help control your period. And like you said, give you, you know, that perfect 28 day cycle. So that really is their best for a lot of classically trained doctors. And that is their way of helping you. I think with medicine too, it is traditionally kind of paternalistic where you go to your doctor, they tell you what they think their recommendations, and you're supposed to follow that. Um, and it is, like you said, seen as a, you know, you're a bad patient if you ask questions and talk back or, you know, if you aren't satisfied with their answers, but only because, you know, if you don't agree with what they're recommending, then either, you know, they don't know how else to help you or for some people who go to the doctor, they're just very difficult. And no matter what you recommend to try to help them, they're going to not do it. So there is kind of that also, um, with the quote unquote bad patient of just, you know, doctor, help me with my diabetes. Well, no, I don't want to change my diet. No, I don't want to take any medication, you know, that kind of thing. Um, of that they're not even helping themselves. So to how to maybe best approach that, you know, if you're going to your doctor and you're going through, you know, anything, but especially, you know, in this, in this area, you know, with having issues with your period or having issues with fertility, I would suggest one of the best things that you could do is, be respectful, of course, that, you know, have your knowledge, you know, your own education, do your own research and maybe don't necessarily disagree, but just show your opinion and your perspective. It's time, ladies. Time to take your fertility awareness, knowledge, and confidence to the next level. Just popping into today's episode to invite you to join us for the next round of Fertility Awareness Mastery Live, my 10-week group coaching program that's designed to help you unlock the secrets of your menstrual cycle. Fertility Awareness Mastery teaches you everything you need to know about using fertility awareness cycle tracking to achieve your intentions. Whether you're currently trying to get pregnant, avoiding pregnancy, or planning to conceive in the future, we've got you covered. This program goes deep. Get to the root of your period problems, hormone imbalances, fertility challenges, and so much more. Early bird registration is now open, but only for a limited time. Head over to fertilityfriday.com slash BAM, F-A-M, to register today. That's fertilityfriday.com slash BAM. Now let's go ahead and jump back into today's episode. You know, if you really don't want to take medication for something, then respectfully, you know, tell them that. Or if you're really concerned about why something is going on, you know, telling them that and trying to, instead of having it be a fight or, or like kind of a undercover thing where you go to your doctor and you leave and you're just unsatisfied to try to have some, you know, conversation about what your perspective is, um, and, and what you need. Sometimes also, you know, the best we can do is what we think the patient wants. But if you don't speak up to what you really want, um, or what you're trying to get out of something, you know, maybe you don't want a pill or, or, you know, a perfect solution 
maybe you do, like you said, you just want to know why something's going on. And sometimes the doctor might just think, oh, you just want a quick answer, but maybe that's not what it is. So trying to express what you want and in your perspective is helpful in that sense. And then what you kind of were touching on also of kind of more global perspective of how things can get better with this. I think, unfortunately, it's going to be a slow process, but I think it is slowly happening of that um, integrative medicine, functional medicine are becoming more mainstream and there is more focus on prevention. And I think with that comes looking at more natural remedies to things, looking at how things work in their optimal way and how I think, at least in my perspective, um, there's a lot more coming out about hormones and how they affect every part of your body and how a variety of different medications can affect your hormones. I think that's becoming more mainstream as well. And so that is encouraging that hopefully more and more people will be more aware of that stuff and be more cautious with prescribing medications, um, prescribing birth control, and have a little bit more discussion about different options. And of course, that will be dependent too on, like I said, if you only have 10 minutes for a, for a doctor's visit, there's not much room in that space to do a lot of the counseling and to talk about different options, to talk about fertility awareness method and things like that. Unfortunately, all the time, there's only time to prescribe a pill. So it's really going to be up to doctors and, and patients to kind of make change and get what they need and uh, get a different perspective. Yeah, no, you touched on so many important points. I think that to add to that, one of the challenges that I see, especially with the work that I'm doing, which is raising awareness, it's really exciting mm -hmm. when you learn all of this information. And I've been in it for a really long time. I've been aware and abreast <laughs> since I was 19. Mm -hmm. And so it's been like a decade and a half for me. But when you first learn it, it's so exciting. You kind of mm -hmm. have this inclination to run to your doctor's office and ram it down his or her throat. <laughs> Wrong audience. Because yeah. imagine if, so, you know, I guess the question for you is, <laughs> so, you know, before you had this personal experience, I stroll into your office and I mm -hmm. already expressed that I'm a bad patient. And I say, you know, Dr. Naylor, I'm having whatever issue and, you know, and you suggest, you would probably suggest the birth control pill. If I start to tell you that I use fertility awareness, I, you know, I'm not on hormonal contraceptives, blah, blah, mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. What would have been your typical response to a patient like me? So I, I don't know if I'm the best example because I tend, I think, to be a little bit more open-minded and more natural perspective. Even when I was on the pill, I was definitely more, you know, I didn't take any other medications really. So I, I am not the typical person necessarily, but I think a lot of people would probably unfortunately register that as like the rhythm method. Like you've talked about that unfortunately is not the same thing at all. And it's just really the lack of awareness would be the issue. And But I think, you know, if you came to your doctor and of course, again, it depends on the doctor's, you know, level of open-mindedness. But if you try to educate your doctor about it, then maybe that will kind of lead to the positive change that our system needs, that, that more doctors should be aware of the fertility awareness method, not only for birth control, but also just that women should know what's going on with their body and take ownership and be able to have that information, that um, knowledge. So, hey, if if you can all go to your doctors <laughs> and tell them what this is and explain to it, maybe bring them a pamphlet or something, then maybe that isn't a bad thing. You know, maybe your doctor won't be receptive to it, but at least you're making them aware of it. Unfortunately, a doctor's office isn't the best place for education of the fertility awareness method in most settings because there isn't the time to go over it. But like I, I mean, even yesterday I had a patient who, um, I removed her hormonal contraceptive implant um, that she'd had for a few years. And I did sit down with her and talk to her about all the different methods, including the fertility awareness method and um, encouraged her to, you know, look into it. But unfortunately, you know, I don't have the, the resources at my own office to teach her myself, but I did definitely talk to her about it and recommend it. And of course she wanted, you know, the Nuva ring instead, like after all those options, a lot of women still just want the pill. 
but I think having the information there and at least talking about it in an appropriate way and an educated way, knowing what it actually is and how it can help people, then that's at least step one, because maybe not every patient is receptive to it and not every doctor is going to be receptive to it, but getting the information out there that what it really is, then that's at least step one to improving things. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And I also agree with what you said a a bit ago when you talked about how the system is set up to be a bit paternalistic, where Mm -hmm. the doctor is the father figure and you're supposed to basically be obedient to your father, Mm -hmm. (laughs) essentially. And I think that one of the challenges is that when you choose to go outside of that kind of accepted norm, which would be hormonal birth control, painkillers, whatever. But when you go outside of that realm, you kind of, you, you end up in that world of, of having to advocate for yourself. And I think the hard thing that I would want the listeners to know is although it's exciting to learn about a, an alternative method, that doesn't make it easy to follow through right. with it. And mm-hmm. when you, because you're excited, you have the, these methods, but because they're not the common dominant methods, because all of your friends aren't talking about them, when you go to your physician and your physician talks to you about how they're not effective and this and that and all those types of things, it puts doubt in your mind. It, it makes you question whether it'll work. It makes you, because you just don't necessarily have the support that you need to feel confident in, in your decisions. Mm-hmm. So I think sometimes I, I almost feel like it's, it's not even ethical to send women to their doctors to ask for things that are outside of what's accepted what your comment earlier about the thyroid testing and how the Mm -hmm. range is developed, that's a sore spot for me as well, because the range is quite large. Mm -hmm. And if you go to one doctor, you would have one test that the doctor would say is completely normal. And you could take that exact same test to a functional doctor who would say, okay, this is a problem. We need to look into your thyroid function. Right. So if you're going, I always say, you know, you need to know what you're getting into you have to be aware of the perspective that your doctor is coming from. Your doctor isn't trying to harm you, right? I mean, your doctor is trying to be helpful and Mm -hmm. they're trying to be helpful within the paradigm that they've been taught. And so I think it's important to understand what that paradigm is and to remember that advocating for yourself is not going to be easy. Right. Yeah. And sometimes it takes, you know, a lot of research on your own, even from my own standpoint, even as a physician, I went through the same thing. It's like, well, which doctor is actually going to listen to me and which one's actually, you know, it's really sad, but which one's actually going to, you know, which one's going to think I'm crazy versus which one will actually order the test that I want. It's sad, but it's true. And I mean, you have to, sometimes it takes, you know, looking for the right fit for you a functional medicine doctor is kind of a good one in my opinion to go to because they do have a different perspective and things being more natural and more focused on wellness, but other, you know, other doctors can be open to it too, but it's just, it's finding that right one and seeing, yeah, like what their perspective is, what their knowledge base is, is going to be really important. And I would definitely encourage women to not give up, not get discouraged if they're not finding the answers that they're looking for with one provider, it can be really frustrating, but to still keep looking, luckily with now with the internet, there is a lot of information out there through things like your podcast and a lot of your guests, you know, their websites and things like that are really beneficial resources for women to hopefully support women in this whole realm to educate themselves and to get the support and information they need. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I also I feel like it's important to just say, you know, don't waste your time trying to convince somebody of something. Right. Don't go yeah. to the doctor's office. And if you see that your doctor is not receptive to what you're saying, they think it's the rhythm method. They really think it's no method. So they, they're they basically mm-hmm. saying, well, we'll just count the days until you get pregnant. Like they really, and they're not, yeah. they don't mean anything negative by it. They are still trying to protect what they consider to be your best interests. So I think right. it's important to recognize that they're not out to get you, right? We it can feel that of way, course. Yeah. but they're coming from a different perspective. So I would say, don't 
waste your time. Don't beat your head against the wall, you know, wrong audience. If you find that you're, and I I say this too, because I've had several clients who've had particularly negative experiences with Mm -hmm. their doctors, even something like um, wanting to switch medication from something that the doctors to something that the doctors typically don't prescribe with very many Mm -hmm. of their patients. You would think that if I ask for something that the doctor is capable of doing, whether it's a test or switching my medication, that the doctor mm-hmm. would be receptive. But sometimes they are not. <laughs> and right. so I think what you said about trying to find a doctor that aligns with your perspective and that is open-minded mm-hmm. enough to hear what you have to say, I think that is a lot better use of your time than wasting your time trying to convince a doctor who is not open-minded. Yeah, definitely. Or, you know, even a doctor may be open-minded, but you know, if they have no knowledge of something, if they're unsure about something, then there's also hesitancy to prescribe something or recommend something that they don't know about. Maybe they'd be willing to do it, but they know how something works and not how something else works, you know, that they don't want to do any harm to you. And so there's also a fear, I think, for doctors who they don't want to give you something that they're not sure about they'd rather give you something that they know, you know, the potential side effects and they know the benefits, even if something else may be better, if they don't know, you know, if they're not confident in that, then I think that's a big issue too, that it really is looking out for what's best for the patient from their perspective. So that might be a big issue too, of just if they aren't comfortable or familiar with something, then it's hard for them to make recommendations because, you know, they can tell you, you know, the efficacy of a birth control pill, but they, they, if they don't know about something else, you know, like fertility awareness method, then they're going to have trouble being able to recommend that confidently for you. And like you said, they, you know, some might just act like they're counting the days until you get pregnant. And some of that might just be because they, yeah, maybe they don't understand and they think that you're just doing nothing. Um, so I, I really like the way that you kind of fleshed that out. Cause I think that Part of, as you can tell, I'm sure by just the way that our interview has gone today, part of this is kind of like, if we're really going to move forward in terms of women's health, then at some point, both sides have to put down our pitchforks. So yeah. I'm trying to put down the pitchfork <laughs> by trying to illuminate kind of the, the, the doctor's perspective so that we can understand that different health professionals come from different perspectives. And it doesn't mean that someone's trying to do harm. It just means they're coming from a different perspective. Um, right. I think that's really important. So I really like the way that you, you talked about that, because I think what can happen is that if you have done your research about something, so whether it's an alternative treatment or an alternative medication that you think you you might be better suited for, and then you go to your physician and they're not open to it or they're hesitant to move forward on it, like you said, because perhaps they just don't know, therefore they don't feel confident. They don't want to put their career on the line for some medication that they're not comfortable with. As a Mm -hmm. patient, you might then question yourself, second guess yourself, think this, you know, is this really valid? And then you end up kind of questioning everything, but really Mm -hmm. it's, it's not about you. It's about the doctor and the fact that perhaps they're not very familiar or comfortable with what you're talking about. Yeah. And remembering that doctors are human too. And I think all humans, you know, do the same thing. I, on the flip side too, um, you know, I go through the same thing. Like I kind of talked about with that one patient, a lot of times, since I do have this perspective of trying to do, make things, you know, do things more naturally and avoiding medications, I get the same pushback from patients too, where I'm recommending natural things, or I'm, I'm counseling them about, you know, that they don't need antibiotics for this, that they don't have an infection. And they'll say, uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah. But I, they usually give me antibiotics and I really want antibiotics. You know, that they want what they want. So it kind of goes both ways too, is that, you know, I think humans in general, you know, they're going to have their opinions and their, their perspective and, um, not everyone's going to be open to different things, but definitely if there's something that you're unsure about, or, you know, something's not sitting well with you that whatever they're recommend recommending doesn't sound right to you, or, or you really want to try something else, then don't give up, you know, be persistent. I think the best thing we can do is advocate for ourselves and 
you know, become one with our body, know what's going on with our own body and, and listen to that and, you know, respect that and really be our own advocate for our health. Well, given our discussion today, we've covered a lot of ground, by the way, (laughs) we've done good. (laughs) We did good. (laughs) What is one thing that you would want the listeners to take away from our conversation? I think the one thing would be just to keep an open mind in every aspect of life. I think, um, looking at other people's perspectives around them, but, you know, being their own advocate and trying to look for the answers that they need or getting what they need out of their own health and being their own advocate is really important for everyone in every sense. Yeah. Oh, well, and from your unique experience then, what would you say is the biggest myth about fertility that you would like to see corrected? Uh, Definitely that it's something that is, it's almost kind of treated as like this magical thing that just happens. You have sex and, and there it goes, you know, like magic happens. Um, and that it's not something that we need to be, you know, know all the details of or be a part of sort of. And I think really under like women understanding their body, their normal menstrual cycle, um, what's normal for them and the things that they can do to help their own fertility and the things that can mess with their fertility. Um, I think is really important. We didn't really go into it too much, but I know you've talked about it a lot on your show is things like xenoestrogens and um, things that are, you know, really disruptive to our hormones, being aware of what's out there in our environment that we're exposing ourselves to things like medications. Um, and of course, diet is so important for everything in life, um, for prevention of diseases and for fertility. I think every woman in my ideal world, everyone should, woman should be aware of all these things to better improve their health in general and to know about how it affects fertility and how they can be aware of their own normal cycle to, to see how, if things are working right or if they're going wrong, um, and to, you know, help their fertility ultimately. And final question of the day for a woman who is currently on the pill or other hormonal contraceptives, and she doesn't want to get pregnant now, but does know that she wants to get pregnant in a couple of years. What advice, if any, would you give to her? So from my own perspective now, I'd say maybe get off the pill a few years out before you're thinking about getting pregnant and trying a different method for someone who really is persistent about wanting to be on the pill and is unsure about doing any other methods then I would say at least definitely start looking into to your nutrition and your health status before, you know, there are, you know, different supplements and things like that that you can start adding on. Um, you can optimize your diet, you can optimize your life in general and still be on the pill um, so that you're addressing the things that can be thrown off because of the pill. Um, things like um, your zinc and copper levels can be thrown off and things like that. It can affect your gut health and things like that as well. So optimizing all of those things, um, at least would be, would be the most beneficial if not getting off the pill and making sure that she's having a normal, healthy cycle prior to trying to get pregnant. Mm -hmm. Well, great words to end on. Well, Miranda, thank you so much for coming on the show. I'm really happy that we were able to have this conversation and I know it's going to be a great one, a really fascinating one for the listeners. Yeah. Thank you for having me. And thank you for, you know, putting this information out there. Like I, you know, I'm definitely someone who's benefited from your podcast and from all the information that, that you're putting out there. So I think it's really great. Um, and I'm glad to be a part of it. Well, thank you so much. And, and for our listeners who do want to learn more about you or listeners who live in your area that um, may be looking for a new doctor after this podcast, yeah. where can they go to get more information about you? Yeah. So, um, so I just started, uh, opened my uh, website. It's drmirandanaylor.com. So D R M I R A N D A N A Y L O R dot com. And I work in Laguna Beach, California. So the information is there on my website for my contact and everything. And if anyone has any questions, you know, feel free to email me. I definitely don't mind giving a medical perspective, but from, you know, a different standpoint um, and kind of how, if you're going through, you know, a similar situation or have any, you know, concerns, I definitely be willing to help with that. Okay. Well, thank you again. This was a lot of fun and very informative. Yeah. Thank you so much. It was great to be here. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, please share it with a friend. 
you'll find the show notes page for today's episode over at fertilityfriday.com slash 376. I hope that you enjoyed my conversation with Dr. Miranda Naylor. As I mentioned at the beginning, I mean, this episode was really eye-opening for me. Since this episode aired, I have interviewed several doctors. And the interesting thing is that I basically heard the same thing. So it's confirmation. I have interviewed Dr. Aviva Ram on two separate occasions. And in the first interview, I really did kind of delve into those, some of those questions about how are doctors trained in my interview with Dr. Nathan Riley. That also shed a lot of information about medical school and residency and how traumatic of a process it can be. And it really gives a lot of insight into why many women experience what they do when seeking medical support. And so again, this is part of the whole picture of what I've been trying to share over the years with the podcast, which is it's not to throw doctors on, under the bus. It's not to create divisiveness, but it's more so that we can all understand each other better. Like if we can all put down our pit- pitchforks and listen to what we what each other has to say, then we can really understand what our doctors specialize in, what they don't, how we can best seek support from our doctors. And then if what we need goes beyond what they are specialized in to really encourage us to kind of look beyond that and get the care that we need. Sometimes that means we need to get the care for certain aspects of our health elsewhere, but it doesn't mean we don't need doctors. It just means that for most of us, when we have a health issue, a collaborative approach, meaning I'm at the head of the boardroom table and you know I have my doctor and maybe I have other practitioners who specialize in other modalities that I might need, that is often what works better for us when we're looking at more of a holistic approach. So with that said, I hope you have a wonderful week, weekend, whenever you're tuning into the show. And of course, as always, until next time, be well and happy charting.